Welcome back to today. We are going to start the fifth lesson in the 30-hour post-licensing course. And I'm Raymond Modulin. I'm the director of Real University. If you have questions during this course, feel free to email me at raymond at realuniversity.com. Now, we have been talking about purchase agreements, and we talked a little bit about um, the issues conceptually. This lesson, we're going to talk a little bit more about offers and counter offers, more in the realistic world and the actual offer itself. Whereas, like I said before, we were talking more about the concept of a counter offer and things of that issue. So the first thing we want to talk about is how, when, and where do you write an offer? Well, the easiest one is where, because that is going to be with today's technology just about anywhere. All right. I've written offers in my office. I've written offers at Starbucks. I've written offers at buyer's houses. I've actually written an offer in the listing house that as we were standing in it uh, with the iPad. So that's pretty much an easy concept is where do you write the offer? And like I say, with today's technology, you can write it just about anywhere. Now, one of the caveats that I will try and tell you is you probably should write it where the buyer feels the most comfortable. And what I mean by that is you don't want them to have to come to your office and pay for parking and get stuck in traffic and go up the elevator and into your office and they've been frustrated because that may flow through to some of the directives they give you to write the offer. Now, that's just a piece of advice. I mean, if, if you can meet them at their home where they're the most comfortable, they're more relaxed, their guards are down, they're going to feel safer if you have to make suggestions, that would be uh, obviously the best place. But like I said, I've written an offer with my iPad leaning over the kitchen bar as the buyers and I stood in the, uh, the showing and we dictated it right there. Now, where you write the offer may also depend on when you write the offer. And what I mean by that is if the offer is on a house that is very sought after and you are afraid it's going to go quickly, you may want to write the offer much sooner than say in a different market. Therefore, that may dictate that you may have to write it immediately so that you can be one of the first, if not the first offer to the seller. So that may be, like I said, in the actual showing. So be prepared for that. Uh, be prepared for that eventuality that your clients may say, I want to write the offer now. So, you know, have the technology with you. If you don't, at least have a copy that maybe you could handwrite the information so that you could write it there. Now, worst case scenario, you could obviously write down all the questions on the notes and go back to your office and type it out and send it to them. But once again, that could be a process of 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And in some markets, that may be a long time if you're trying to be the first offer in. You may say, okay, you want to write an offer, let's leave the house just in case somebody's listening, all right? And there is a new buyer, and we talked about that in the forum, there's a new buyer's uh, clause in the buyer's exclusive agency that says now that buyers recognize that there could be video or audio recording of the seller from their home. So you may not want to do that uh, right there. Now, like I said, technology has changed. Potentially, it's a lot easier for them to eavesdrop, so to speak, on you if you're writing the offer. So you may say, hey, let's write the offer. Let's go outside on the hood of the car. I've done that. Let's go from here straight to a Starbucks or a Panera's or to the library and immediately write the offer there more of a neutral place for them. So when you write the offer could dictate where you write the offer as well. So keep that in mind. Now, how you write the offer is the other concept. How you are writing the offer is going to be, once again, dependent upon the market, 
It's going to be dependent upon the qualification of your buyer. It's going to be dependent upon the motivation of your buyer. And what I mean by that is if this is one that they like, they might write an offer. If it's one they absolutely love and they must have, how you write that offer may be different as well. All right, so keep that in mind that how, when, and where you write the offer, there is no magic bullet. I can't say you got to write it in 10 minutes on uh, e-signature and here's what you put in because that's not going to be the case. The more of these you write, the better adept you're going to be at learning to understand where the trade-offs are, where versus when, you know, how you write it. And we'll talk about some concepts and some uh, quote unquote tricks that you can use when on the how part, all right? Now, one of the things you need to understand is when you submit the offer, you actually are going to submit more than the offer, all right? So you're going to actually submit, obviously, the purchase agreement. That's gonna be the first thing that you are going to submit. You are also going to submit any of the addendums that are going with the purchase agreement. And there are many different addendums and I've listed just a few here. And these addendums may go with the offer, they may not go with the offer. Once again, it goes back to, you know, what type of offer. If it's as is, you may have to write an as is addendum. If it's a, if they're asking for some personal property, there is a form for personal property. There's an escalation clause. Now, we're not going to go into the escalation clause per se. And if you're not sure what the escalation clause is, check with your managing broker or send me an email. But basically, it's just a abbreviated type of auction that allows your one offer to escalate to some final price by some increment so that you, quote unquote, don't have to counter, all right? There's the new COVID. Um, they were using that during the, the COVID lockdown. Now, I'm not sure how long people are going to continue to use that, but it may be another one. There's gonna be a site, site unseen acknowledgement. Um, that site unseen acknowledgement signed by the buyers, not necessarily signed by the seller. You may wanna send it over as well. You're also going to have to send over the lead-based paint if it's required for that property that the seller has given you. And if you remember, there's a little box on our purchase agreement that said it has or has not been received or seen. I would suggest this would be one that you should never write. You, sh you as a professional should get this document from the seller if you know this house is, that you're seeing is built in 1978 or before. Most listing agents now with this technology have attached it to the listing. So if you're seeing several properties, I would suggest that you get prepared to write the offer at the house. That would be the ultimate way to get prepared. Now, if they don't write the offer or you go somewhere else or that you want to write it later that evening, then you've got that ability to go back and, and collect the document uh, somewhere else. But if you've got it with you, then you don't look unprepared if they're like, hey, let's write this offer right now. And you're like, uh, I didn't bring my iPad. I don't have any paperwork. That's going to be the first sign to them that you may not be as professional as you should be. So I would download all the lead-based paint for all the showings you're going to see, as well as you're going to send back the seller's disclosure, which as well you can download prior to going in to the, see the listing. So all of those should be there. And then obviously one thing you're going to want to send is the pre-approval letter from your buyer client. Hopefully your buyer client is pre-approved. If they are not, then that is a business choice that you have made to show a client that maybe is not qualified. I would say in today's market, most everybody gets pre-approved. And if you can't do that quickly, 
Well, let me take that back. You can do that quickly. So um, probably I would suggest to you that you actually ask your buyer, are they pre-approved? And if they're not, you need to guide them to a lender to get pre-approved for several reasons. One is that make sure they are actually a buyer. You don't want to show someone a house or four or five houses and realize they had a bankruptcy that just got opened last week. Two is it also makes your offer to the uh, seller stronger by saying, hey, you're, you know, they're pre-approved. So, so those are the documents that you're going to actually use when you write the offer. Now, there's always been a question about how you present the offer. And that is a great question. So let's move on. No, I'm sorry. I was just, 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 just joshing you. How you present the offer is actually as less important as people think. And I'll tell you why. There is one case when it could be important. Because you are actually presenting this offer to the agent of the seller. Very few cases, very few cases do you as the agent get to present the offer directly to the seller himself? First of all, that's the whole reason agents exist is to buffer the buyer and the seller from having direct contact. And if the buyer is wanting to write an offer, the buyer's agent presents it to the uh, seller's agent or the listing agent that is his job. If you're bypassing that to go to the seller, potentially that listing agent's not doing what he should do, and that's a whole other discussion. But if you are going to present that offer, you can even still present it to the listing agent in a way that is more favorable than just faxing over or emailing the offer, and I get this all the time. You, get a text that says, hey, we just sent you an offer, and that was it. That re is reliant upon me as the listing agent to see your offer and then pitch it to the seller. If you, as the selling agent working with the buyer, pitch that offer to the listing agent and do it in such a light that the listing agent really enjoys it or likes it or thinks it's a good offer, he may be more favorable in the way he pitches it to his client. You know, one of the things that you, you can do as the buyer is establish the motivation of the seller. Why are, why are they selling? Do they need money now? Do they just need a lot of money? Time may not be important. Have they already got a vacant home? Is this an investment home that they're trying and tired of dealing with landlords? So knowing that would allow you to present the offer to go, hey, here's the highest price that our buyer can give, or here's a price that will close, or I'm sorry, here's an offer that will close in 10 days. Right out of the gate, you have struck the cord of the seller by seeing, oh, yes, I like this because it's gonna close in 10 days. The second thing I would do is always discuss the qualifications of the buyer. Hey, I'm sending you from an offer that's buyer that's well qualified. We've got a pre-approval, you know, so that he can pass that information along. The earnest money, believe it or not, to me is actually an important topic. I remember the house that I'm living in now that we bought with my wife. Uh, we bought, I bought with my wife or that we bought. <laughs> um, we actually made the earnest money non-refundable the day the offer got accepted. All right. Now, I know what you're thinking. Geez, Raymond, you're freaking crazy. Well, no, because we were more than qualified to buy this house. And we wanted our offer to rise above two other offers that were, I know, on the table. And the way that we did that was to ensure that the seller, if he dealt with us, was going to get paid $2,500 even if we didn't close. So we literally said, hey, our earnest money is going to go hard the day he accepts the property. 
meaning that there was no way I was going to ask back. So I made sure I communicated that to the listing agent. And when the listing agent called me back, he's like, okay, Raymond, we've accepted your offer. I'm sending you over the acceptance. You're on the clock. <clears throat> so I think it's important. If you're putting a lot of earnest money down or you're making it cash or you're putting a you know large sum like two or three percent, that should be something that you would enunciate to the listing agent so that he would understand and communicate that. Um, review the benefits of the offer. Hey, here's the offer. And this goes back up to number one, the, their motivation. If you know their motivation, make sure that when you send the offer over, you key in on that as one of the benefits. Hey, my buyer's a cash buyer. We're gonna close this property in four days. I know it's a vacant home and your sellers are carrying uh, taxes and insurance and utilities. Here's an offer that's gonna solve that problem. Let me know what you think, all right? So there are some things that you can do when you present it and your hope is to obviously sway the seller to, or I'm sorry, sway, sway the listing agent, the agent of the seller, so that when he presents the offer, you want him to go, Oh, here's an offer and here's an offer, but here's an offer from a cash buyer that says they'll close in three days. Bada bing, that's exactly what you're searching for. Now, there is a case if you're ever working with a for sale by owner where potentially you might, uh, well, you're working with the buyer, but you're buying a for sale by owner where you potentially would deal directly with the seller himself. If that's the case, the same scenarios still play out. You want to establish what their motivation is. You want to discuss the qualification of your buyer. You want to talk about the earnest money. You want to uh, talk about the benefit of the offer, which ties into their motivation. So all of these things would be what you would use when you would present the offer. Now, remember, Indiana works under what's called the statute of frauds rule. The statute of frauds rule says they all have to be in writing. So make sure that you write the offer. I have gotten as a listing agent plenty of times, uh, people call me and go, hey, tell your investor I'll give them 100 grand for the house. Dude, you gotta write that down. You know, hey, I'll help you write the offer and I can become a limited agent, but I just can't call my uh, guy and say, hey, we've got a verbal offer for 100 grand. 100 grand. All right. Now, there's always this question about how much time do you give the seller to respond? And we have touched on this once before, but let me go over it here. Let me show you something. I've got this magical curve, which is made up and has no, what's the word? No statistical proof other than 20 years of experience. I call it the time versus hair deal. And I think I've mentioned what hair is. Hair is the degree of difficulty that you have written the offer. And the curve looks like this. So what I'm telling you is, the more difficult your offer is, the more time you should give that person. If it's a very simple offer, you would give less time. So what I'm saying here is, if you're writing an offer that's cash, no contingencies, that's a very easy offer to understand. I would give a very short time frame on that because you don't want them to think about it. You have given them exactly what they're looking for and all of a sudden, bang, they write the offer. Now, if you're writing an offer up here and you're asking for a land contract and you want the seller to pay some of the closing fees and you don't want it recorded and you're 10 grand under the price, you probably want to make sure that you give them a little more time to think about it and go through all of the potentials. Because I'm telling you here, if you give a really busy offer or hairy offer and you give them a short time frame, what's going to happen is their initial knee-jerk reaction is to just go, no, I don't even have time to process what they just wrote. You know, they want it 
a land contract, they wanted 10,000 below their price, they want me to pay some of the closing, and they want us to respond in six hours, well, that's easy. The answer is no. So think about that. Think about that time versus hair difficulty. Now, you've also got that hot market theory. The hot market is, um, if it's a market where there's, you know there's going to be multiple offers, that could, in essence, shift this curve a little bit over here. So something that you may have given this much time frame, now you've given this much time frame because you're here. All right? So think, keep that in mind that the hot market could shift that curve one way or the other depending on what you need it to do. The other concern that you have to worry about is when you uh, offer a property that's above value, Say you've got a value here. And I use my mythical 100,000 and you write an offer above the value. You've got to worry about this amount of money and is the appraiser going to be, uh, is the appraisal and the appraiser going to kill this deal? Because in our purchase agreement, remember there is a clause, and I think it's line 37, that says if the value, if the uh, agreed purchase price is above the appraisal value, let's say it comes in at appraised here, all right, then either party has the right to terminate or renegotiate, which typically means the seller comes down. Now, there have been in this hot market a lot of buyers that have said, you know what, we will go ahead and agree to this price. If the appraisal comes in here, we will pay the overage ourselves. Now keep in mind what that's saying is, if your lender is giving your buyer client an 80% loan to value, they still have to bring that 20,000 here, right? But if you've agreed to this concept, they now have to bring 100% of the overage, so they're actually bringing 30,000 to the closing table. If this is the concept you want to use, remember that you may have to write that in the other section of the purchase agreement, because by definition, the, the agreement says that either party has a right to terminate. All right, I know this section was pretty long and this was from the buyer side. We're gonna stop the here and come back, take a small break. We're gonna talk about the offers and counter offers from the seller's side or seller's point of view.